the Trump administration's decision to ask a federal appellate court to uphold a district court ruling invalidating the entire Affordable Care Act underscores the ongoing conflict over health care reform. Yet for all the controversy that has surrounded it, the ACA has transformed the health care landscape in ways that make it difficult to displace. I'm Stephen Morrissey, Managing Editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, and I'm talking with Jonathan Oberlander, a professor of social medicine and health policy and management at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Professor Oberlander has written a perspective article about the persistence of Obamacare under a divided government. Professor Oberlander, in your perspective article, you described the decision by the district court judge in Texas versus Azar that the ACA was ultimately unconstitutional because the penalty for not buying insurance had been reduced to zero. Can you explain the judge's reasoning in this case and what the response has been? This case was brought by 20 Republican state attorneys general, and essentially Judge O'Connor accepted their argument, and their argument was the following, that the Affordable Care Act, when it was upheld by the Supreme Court as constitutional in 2012, the individual mandate penalty at that time was upheld as constitutional under Congress's power to tax. Subsequently, a Republican majority in Congress repealed the penalty that goes along with the individual mandate. So while the individual mandate is technically still on the books, there is no penalty that accompanies it. So they argued that because there is no penalty, it cannot be constitutional as a tax because nobody's paying anything for it anymore. And because the individual mandate is core to the rest of the ACA, The rest of the law is not what's called severable from it, meaning that if you pull out the individual mandate and deem that illegal, then the entire law has to be struck down. That was the argument of those Republican state attorneys general, and that's exactly the reasoning that Judge O'Connor used to overturn the entire law. So the Trump administration initially argued that only the ACA's mandate and the pre-existing condition protections should be struck down, but the administration now supports invalidating the entire ACA. Why this change in course? There have been reports of conflicts within the Trump administration over how to handle this. And I think ultimately what's important to understand is this is less about constitutional law than about politics. And the president from the very beginning has made it a priority to overturn Obamacare. And I believe the president and some members, though not all of his administration, see this case as another opportunity to have the courts do what Republicans in Congress could not do after the 2016 elections, and that's to strike the law down. So the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit is soon going to hear oral arguments in Texas v. Azar. How is the case expected to proceed? Do you think it's eventually going to go to the Supreme Court? The Fifth Circuit is going to hear oral arguments this summer in this case. Most legal scholars do not think that this challenge, the Affordable Care Act, has very much merit at all. And in fact, what is somewhat unique about this particular case is that there is a broad array of both liberal and conservative legal experts and legal scholars who think that the original decision in this case was wrong, in particular because In order to make that decision, Judge O'Connor had to ignore the norm that courts defer to congressional intent. And Congress, when it got rid of the penalty, and that goes along with the individual mandate, kept the rest of the law. So you can infer from that that Congress wanted to keep the rest of the law. Judge O'Connor, among other things, ignored that rather important precept. Most legal observers expect that the Fifth Circuit is going to overturn his decision. There's a divide in the legal community. Many believe that this will not get to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court will not take this case because the challenge is so weak. However, we would do well to remember that there have been lots of predictions over the legal struggles involving the Affordable Care Act, and many of those predictions have turned out not to be right, so we just won't know. As a practical matter, how has the zeroing out of the individual mandate penalty affected the insurance marketplaces? It has not had a dramatic impact yet. And I say yet because we'll have to see what changes over time. The enrollment in the ACA's insurance marketplaces have been mostly stable. Mostly there's been some diminution of enrollment, but not a dramatic one. And the question is going forward whether younger, healthier persons opt out because there is no longer a penalty. And Again, we have not seen a dramatic impact on enrollment, but it's early days yet, and we'll have to see over time what happens, as well as what happens 
in terms of the proportion of Americans who choose to buy plans under the Trump administration's new rules that expand the availability of short-term coverage and other plans that don't have to adhere to the ACA's benefit standards. You say in your article that there's ample precedent for progress in health policy when Democratic and Republican parties share institutional power, including in the past changes to Medicare payment, Medicaid eligibility. Is this time around fundamentally different? Is that kind of cooperation not going to happen, do you think? It seems to be. We've had, as you say, lots of episodes of progress in health policy under divided government when Democrats and Republicans came together and really worked on a practical basis and put their ideologies aside to some extent to better programs, to improve programs. This time does seem to be different. The Affordable Care Act can't seem to get out of the existential category of political debate where Democrats and Republicans are still very much contesting whether it's there at all. And as a result, ACA politics seem to have a different character. They're more partisan. There's much more conflict. And here we are nearly a decade later, and the conflict that started over the law's enactment still has not ended. And that means it has been functionally impossible in Congress to pass legislation that would remedy some of the ACA's shortcomings and strengthen the law. So from there, finally, what do you see the effect of the 2020 elections being? What's the chance we're going to see major health policy reform that either undoes or substantially supports the law? The paradox of the ACA is that in some respects, it's politically as strong as it has ever been. It's very popular right now. More states have embraced Medicaid expansion. There's more discussion of the parts of the law that are popular, including the consumer protections around pre-existing conditions. And yet, in 2020, we're likely to have candidates, both Democrat and Republicans, who really want to move beyond and supplant the ACA. President Trump, of course, will talk again about repealing and replacing the law. And the Democrats may very well nominate a candidate who wants to go far beyond the ACA, either backing Medicare for all or Medicare for more, which is a remarkable departure, really, from the Democratic position a decade ago. I think the chances for large-scale change, for a major transformation in the direction of U.S. health policy will depend not just on the White House, but what happens in Congress. And if we have divided government, the ACA is likely to remain in limbo. If one party wins unified control of government in the 2020 elections, then we could move in a very different direction in 2021. Thank you, Professor Oberlander.